Welcome to our panel discussion on the Japanese economy with John Greenwood and Richard Katz, the first in our series of EconView subscriber events. My name is Lyric Hughes-Hale, and I'm the editor-in-chief of EconView based in Chicago, and your moderator today, Wednesday, October 26, 2022. We would like to thank the Dylan Schneider Group for their kind sponsorship of this discussion, which is on the record. A replay will be posted, which we encourage you to share. Our panelists will be taking questions at the conclusion of their remarks. Japan's inflation rate of 3% is the envy of other central banks. Bank of Japan Governor Kuroda says that he has no plans to raise interest rates or tighten monetary policy. With inflation rising worldwide, Japan has proven once again to be the exception to the rule. Why is this, and are there lessons we can take from Japanese monetary policy? At the firm level, could Japanese companies capitalize on a weak yen and cheap capital to stage a revival in innovation and productivity? Discussions on the Japanese economy can be boring. I assure you that this will not be. I am very pleased to welcome you and introduce you to two old friends. John Greenwood, who's speaking to us today from London, is former chief economist at Invesco. He now heads his own consultancy, International Monetary Monitor, and is also affectionately known as the father of the Hong Kong peg. He is one of the most respected voices in global macroeconomics. He believes in the causal relationship between money, supply, and inflation, and that Japan does not, in fact, practice easy monetary policy. Richard Katz is a longtime observer and commentator on the Japanese economy. He is New York correspondent for business weekly Toyo Keizai and is the author of Japan Economy Watch, which is available on Substack and I highly recommend. He does not believe that money supply is the key issue. Based upon his in-country research at the firm level, he's written that Japan could, could see a rebirth of innovation, but there is no guarantee that the country won't miss yet another opportunity due to bureaucratic momentum. Let me say at the outset that our panelists see the Japanese economy from two different lenses, which I hope will combine to give you a parallax view of the world's third largest economy. So let's begin. So, John, do you uh, mind recapping your recent paper on Japan's uh, interest monetary policy for our listeners? And you say that Japan is, in fact, suffering from the effects of, of tight monetary policy, not loose monetary policy. And this is in spite of the fact that the BOJ's balance sheet, as you write, is has risen from 16 to 135% of GDP, and interest rates do remain ultra low. So could you share your thoughts with us this morning? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's good to see some familiar names among the audience, too. Um, fundamentally, monetary policy is not about interest rates. Although everybody in the press, in the central banks, in the media, always focus on interest rates, or to an extent QT, which is the balance sheet of the central bank. Monetary policy is fundamentally about the quantity of money in the hands of the public at large, that is in the hands of companies and individuals. Because if you think about it, the money which is on the books of the central bank, that is mainly cash currency, which is small in modern economies, plus the reserves of banks. The, re the reserves of banks are by far the largest part, and they are not used for spending in the economy. What we use to spend in the economy is the deposits that we have in the banking system. And the observations, you said I believed in money. It's not that I believe in it. It's the empirical evidence that is important. Um, what, <clears throat> what we observe is that in any country where the stock of money 
broad money in the hand that's money in the hands of the public, not money on the books of the central bank. When that money stock is increased rapidly for a sustained period of time, the result is first a surge in asset prices, second a strengthening after some time of the economy, and then third after a further lag, an increase of inflation. And that's exactly what's happened, for example, in the United States since the Fed turned on the afterburners when COVID hit the US in February, March of 2020. We had big surge in the stock market. We had a big surge in housing prices. Um, then the economy picked up very strongly. And now we've got inflation in exactly that order. But the interesting thing is what happens to interest rates. In the first five or six months after, the, after COVID struck, interest rates fell. So the first effect of rapid money growth is that interest rates decline. <clears throat> but then as the economy picks up, the demand for credit rises and people start to expect inflation. Then interest rates start to rise very sharply as they have been doing in the bond markets for the past year now. So the first effect of, of rapid money growth is to lower interest rates. The second effect is to raise them. Now, my paper on Japan said that Japan had done exactly that, except that in, in the reverse order. What happened in Japan in the late 80s was there was a bubble in the stock market, bubble in real estate, and the governor of the Bank of Japan um, wanted to uh, curtail inflation, which was picking up towards 4%. So he squeezed, he tightened money, interest rates rose, and the money stock slowed down from 12% down to about 5%. <clears throat> so the first thing was interest rates rose, but then as the economy weakened, the demand for credit fell, and inflation expectations fell away, interest rates declined. And basically, Japan has been in that what I call low interest rate equilibrium ever since because they have not increased the quantity of money. They've manipulated interest rates up and down a little bit, but basically policy has been focused on interest rates instead of being focused on the quantity of money as it should have been. One of the things you said I wanted to, to ask you more detail about, you said uh, this was one of the problems was that the Bank of Japan, as part of QE, bought JGBs, but they bought them from banks rather than non-banks. And that if they had bought them from non-banks, the effect would have been the opposite. Could you explain that a little bit? And where, mm. who are the not, Japan is dominated by the banking sector. Who are the non-banks in Japan? Oh, they oh, could no, have done not, it. Oh, oh no, it's okay. not. Oh, okay. no, it's not, Merrick. All right. So explain how you see that. Sure. <clears throat> well, the, the thing is this. When there is a crisis, people panic and they, there is a dash for cash. So they want money or safe securities. <laughs> and traditionally, what a central bank would do would be to provide that money, to provide that cash. Okay. And then after the crisis was over, it would take it back in again. Um, that is, it would withdraw it. Now, the basic idea behind QE is exactly the same. So what happened in the, the time of the GFC was, because everybody's familiar with that example, um, there was a, a panic because of the bankruptcy of major financial institutions you know, like um, Lehman and Freddie and Fannie and AIG and so on. And so everybody just wanted cash. And in order to provide that cash, uh, because the banks weren't lending, they themselves were suffering securities losses and loan losses. They were shrinking their balance sheets. Um, if that had been allowed to continue, the money supply would have shrunk, would have reduced, and we would have had a repeat of what happened between 1931 and 1933, when the stock of money in America declined by one third. Um, instead of that, by having the Fed and the Bank of England 
step in and buy securities from non-banks, that is insurance companies, pension funds, money managers, sovereign wealth funds, corporates, households, and all of those exist in Japan. Um, what the central banks were doing in effect was putting money into the hands of those entities in, the pla in place of the securities that the central bank purchased from them, the government securities. So that directly increased the stock of money. The central bank in effect wrote a check to those companies, said in exchange for the bond you've sold me, the JGB or the, um, the, the US Treasury bill or the, uh, the gilt, here's the amount. And people, those entities, of course, all this happened electronically, but basically those entities would take their check to their commercial bank, place it on deposit, the money supply is increased, and then the bank would take that security or that, that uh, money draft for settlement at the central bank. And the bank in turn would receive an, a, a credit to its reserve deposits at the central bank. So in effect, what happened in the US and the UK was that the central banks stepped in and created money at a time when the commercial banks were not creating money. And that was a very good thing to do. The, the Bank of England, um, Mervyn King has told us, was very surprised how big, how, what scale they had to do it on because you know, uh, central banks were quite small relative to the total banking system. But Anyway, it worked. In Japan, <laughs> by contrast, and in the Europe, in the European situation, under in the eurozone, the ECB and the Bank of Japan have bought almost all of their securities not from non-banks but from banks. So when they buy JGBs or JREITs or um, uh, ETFs from <clears throat> banks. The banks <clears throat> receive a credit from the central bank in the form of reserves at the central bank. The bank who sold the securities, the JGB, gives up the, the JGB and receives in exchange that credit. So for the central bank, both sides of the balance sheet have okay. expanded. Money on the books of the central bank have expanded, as I said at the beginning. That's a certain type of money, but it's not important for the economy. As far as the banks are concerned, they've given up a security and they've now received cash in exchange. Uh, that is reserves at the central bank. So they've just done an asset swap. But the money supply in the hands of the public hasn't increased at all. It was just so, an asset swap. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so by doing it that way, they've basically wasted ammunition. They've bought all this huge amount of securities, but it's had no effect in boosting money. And as a result, Japan has been in this sort of near deflationary state for the last 30 years. I've hit my head against a wall with the Japanese um, members of the policy board to try to get them to do something different, uh, but it hasn't worked. So you think QE, which was invented in Japan, as I understand it, has been a failure in Japan and has really hurt them because of the way that they executed it. Is that fair to say? Well, it certainly hasn't solved their deflation problem to the extent that it, it could have done. Now, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. It, this is not going to solve the problems of growth in the economy. It's not going to solve the aging problem. It's not going to solve the innovation problem. It's not going to solve the technology problem. You know, this is simply addressed to what's happening to the price level. If they had created more money, but if the rate of growth of broad money, money in the hands of the public, as I said at the beginning, not money on the books of the central bank, if money in the hands of the public had grown more rapidly, then prices in Japan would have risen more rapidly uh, than, okay. than they did. That, that, that's really... Uh, Thank you. And, uh, and Rick, how does this track with your view of the Japanese economy and I'm hoping that you'll be able to talk to some of those subjects that John just mentioned, uh, sure. for example, I, innovation. Yeah, I, I see it very, very differently. Um, 
you know, there are conditions under which the relationship between the economy and monetary policy, money supply, work exactly as John said. And there are other circumstances in which it does not. And if you look at Japan, say, where we have the data from 1970 to 1997, it worked exactly as John said. The Bank of Japan would increase the reserves. The banks would take those reserves, lend it out to people who would borrow it, spend money on goods and services. Hold on, John. You, we, Hold on, John. <laughs> I, we already know we disagree. So, but we have a one-finger interjection you. here. Okay, okay. So... Um, and and so the reserves of the central bank at at the central bank, the money supply, and nominal GDP all rose at more or less the same level for that period of of nearly three decades in textbook fashion. Then after 1997, things changed. the The Bank of Japan was trying to pump in money. In fact, those reserves increased by 13 fold, 13 fold, and yet the money supply only doubled which is not nothing, it doubled. And, and, but nominal GDP hardly rose. And this is not unique, that severity is not unique to Japan. But the delinkage between money supply and nominal GDP is widespread. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there is no major central bank in the world that I'm aware of, which uses money supply as its guide to monetary policy. They target interest rates, they target expectations, and the Fed has put out a path for explaining why, because there really has not been in the last couple of decades, for various reasons, a good correlation between money supply and inflation and nominal GDP. Well, just maybe it's... And in fact, let me just finish one more <laughs> sentence. Milton Friedman, in an interview with the Financial Times, given a few months before he died, said, it turns out that targeting money supply has not been a great success. And if I were to do it all over again, I wouldn't push it as hard as I used to. So the fact, and the key question is demand in the real economy. If you pump up money supply and, and then companies borrow and spend and invest and consumers borrow and spend and, and then there is this correlation. But if demand in the real economy is weak, you can put out as much money as you want. You can lead a horse to water, but if the horse won't drink, nominal GDP and real GDP is not going to grow. And that's why we have the delinkage. The problem in Japan is the lack of demand in the real economy for assorted reasons we can go into. And that is the source of why the interest rates are so low. The interest rates reflect that weak demand in the real economy. Okay, well, we'll go back to that, but I think John would like to to respond. <clears throat> I think he would like to respond, and maybe he thinks, uh, are central banks doing that well? Um, should they be maybe be targeting money supply <clears throat> right now? So, Well, exactly, that's the issue. I mean, precisely because they have not been paying attention to money. That's why we have inflation everywhere. Do you think this inflation came from just from real demand, a sudden change in consumer psychology? No, not at all. It's happened because we've had rapid money growth. And to speak about Japan, for the first time, finally, uh, after 10 years, almost 10 years, um, Kuroda-san, the governor of the Bank of Japan, has got his 2% inflation. But he's got it because, not so much because of QE, but because of what the Bank of Japan did during the the, the pandemic, it copied the Bank of England's funding for lending policy, and it made loans to banks on condition that they made loans uh, to companies. Mm -hmm. And as a result, money growth accelerated to about 9% at the peak. Uh, and subsequently, it slowed down. Now we're back at 3%. So we're having this little episode of inflation in Japan, precisely as two years to the day, you know, from the time when money growth peaked, it's working like a dream. Uh, but you know, it's going to go back to 3% because the Bank of Japan is not concerned with money growth. Kuroda and his acolytes think they can do it through interest rates uh, or YCC and so on. 
Um, but you know, as I say, it 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 does work, and um, you know, I I don't want to challenge um, Rick too much, but I mean, it, it's not correct to say that it worked only till 1997. After 1997 in Japan, um, money growth was negligible. It remained at you know, 2% or 3%, which is not enough for uh, Japan. Japan at the time needed about 5 or 6% rate of growth. And that's why um, QE was adopted in 2001, um, because nothing else was working. Uh, but but then they did QE in a sense the wrong way. They did it, as I said, by by buying securities from banks rather than non-banks. So, although the Bank of Japan's balance sheet expanded very rapidly, as I said at the beginning, that's money on the books of the central bank, not money in the hands of the public, and therefore, you know, it didn't really have any effect. And you can see that because when they un unwound that first program of QE in between April and June of 2006, they unwound 17 trillion dollars, 17 trillion yen, um, with almost no effect whatsoever on, uh, on the money markets. It was just an asset swap in the reverse direction. So in my view, uh, the analysis does work, and um, it also explains why Japan is having this little blip of inflation at the moment. What actually so explains <laughs> why Japan is having the blip of inflation? 90% of that inflation is in about 36% of the economy, which is to say import intensive food and energy sectors. There's virtually there's very little uptick in the overall economy. So the, the inflation does not reflect increased demand in the economy or the money supply. What it reflects is the fact that the yen has crashed. And if you look for some, not only in the last year, but going back 10 years, when Kuroda began his program of, of basically pushing the yen downward, 90% of all of the price increases in Japan came from these uh, import-intensive sectors because the prices of imports, of energy, of food, rose. Uh, just, uh, and I think that that's key. And certainly that you say, you know, just to use the U.S. example, when you say, well, just came after the money supply increase, but it also came after they, they put tons of money, as did other governments, in the hands of the public who had, therefore, lots of money to spend. It was hard for them to spend it when the economy was closed down because of COVID. And when the economy opened up, they just started spending like crazy. And that's what produced the, that's what produced the, the, the inflation. But okay. I just said, the key thing here is money supply works when the the banks are lending money. People take that money, spend it. The people who receive the money they spend put it back in the deposits in the banks, and the whole thing works like a charm. But when when it doesn't, it, it doesn't work. One final point: it would have made zero difference. Uh, John's big argument, I think, is that if the central bank had bought securities from the non-corporates, non-banks instead of the banks. Well, look at the actual balance sheet of Japan's corporations. In the last 20 years, they have tripled, tripled their ownership of cash and securities. The cash flow is rising like crazy in Japan, but they're not taking that cash flow and investing it in new equipment or higher wages. So that the total capacity of the private business sector in Japan, factories, offices, machinery, et cetera, has had zero growth for the past couple decades, but the cash they hold in JGBs or other securities has tripled. So if the Bank of Japan were to buy from them instead of, uh, instead of injecting into the banks, they would have done the same thing, turned around and invested it in paper instead of, instead of equipment or people, and the effect would have been exactly the same. So you're describing a structural issue here. We, I think you both agree that wages have remained low in Japan for quite some time. And of course, that dampens demand. But companies can control that. Um, so 
isn't wouldn't now be the ideal time for Japanese companies to raise wages? And wouldn't that have the desired effect? Why don't they do that? Well, sometimes, you know, the, the worst enemies of capitalism are capitalists who, who think short term, but also think individually. A corporation thinks if I cut wages and build up my cash, just in case there's a debt crisis, I'll have this cash for a rainy day. That's how risk. they explain it. Right. Yeah. It's about that risk aversion for me. Mm-hmm. But if everybody cuts wages, who's going to spend on consumer goods and services? And if they're not spending on consumer goods and services, then why invest in expanded capacity? If you look at the savings rate of Japanese, the savings rate has gone way down. They, they save less than Americans do now, where they used to be double digits. And it's, so they're not spending because they're too scared to spend. They're not spending because their income is too low. And savings now, there are, as well. And the government asking companies to raise wages is not how, why companies raise wages. So, yes, I agree, with, I agree with, with what you said in your question. And there are tools the government could use. It's not using them. And that would do a lot. Yes, the Bank of Japan has got to have monetary policy. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Unless it's linked with other policies, it's impotent. If it's linked with other policies, it's very powerful. So, John, how do you see that, the bigger picture, this this other issue of how companies behave in Japan? Well, everything that Rick said is um, kind of, True uh, at a superficial level. Companies, sure, they hold um, oh, loads, of, loads of securities. They hold loads of cash and so on. But the, the issue is not, you know, the, the, the sheer size of those holdings. The issue is what is the purchasing power of Japan Inc., if you like, that is households and corporates together. And if you measure that correctly, you know, by the a broad stock of money, M2 is probably the best measure in Japan. Um, Then what you'll see is that that has only been growing very slowly. Now, it is possible for credit, other types of um, loans and so on, to grow more rapidly. For example, in China, um, money growth has been very slow, but they've had a huge um, expansion in credit, and as a result, they've got an over-leveraged economy now. So you can have credit growth behaving quite differently. Now, a lot of that, as in Japan, is non-bank credit. But the unique thing about banks and their deposits is that, that they can create deposits essentially out of nothing. It's what we call fountain pen money uh, from the days when Bankers sat on high, high chair, high stools in front of a high desk, you know, and wrote with their quill pens in ledgers. But basically, it's the same process today. That banks, um, they do not make loans, as Rick said, and that's when I waved my finger. They do not make loans by drawing on reserves. That is a mistake. Reserves are only used essentially or settlement between banks. Um, They don't, when they make a loan, they don't draw on their reserves. Um, So what we're interested in is how that total of money rather than credit grows, because at the end of the day, if you want to buy anything, you have to have money. Of course, you can borrow to buy it, but ultimately you've got to pay pay that borrowing back with money. So at the end of the day, it's money which drives spending on goods and services. And you find this you know, across you know, all the different eras for which we have data and across all the different countries, irrespective of the habits and behavior uh, of the people. So you know, I, I, I grant that you know, Japan is a very unusual society. I lived there myself for four years. And you know, one of the intriguing things for me was that despite the differences between the Japanese and Western people, the impact of monetary growth on the economy you know, was exactly the same. It behaved in exactly the same way. And by the way, these were the days you know, of 
the oil crises and so on, and, and it's continued to this day. I would well, argue, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Just on the data, I, I, I disagree with John on the data. Uh, two things I would say. One is, since 1997, the amount of the money supply has increased by almost 250% in Japan. Now, he might have wanted to increase by 500%, but 250% is not zero. It's something. On the other hand, nominal GDP over those 25 years has been not increased hardly at all. So if, if there were this correlation between money supply and demand in the real economy and growth in the real economy under all conditions, as John posits, then the nominal GDP should have likewise grown, you know, doubled or whatever, but it barely increased. And it's not, that is the case, in one sense he's right that Japan is not different because all of the world's major central banks have said, in fact, the correlation that John posits between money supply and growth in all circumstances, in all countries, at all times, they're saying, no, it doesn't. And that's why we no longer target it because the past correlation no longer holds because of institutional changes and all sorts of other, other sorts of changes. So Stop. that John, John is disagreeing with most of the world's central banks. That doesn't make him wrong. He also disagrees with Friedman's last interview. Again, it doesn't make him wrong, but it is worth noting. But I just, I think on the data, he, his, his data is simply incorrect about Japan. So could we look at another structural difference um, in the Japanese economy, which is the Bank of Japan is itself a listed company on the stock exchange, which is, I don't, I don't know of any other central bank. If anybody knows about it, I would be interested. They're the largest uh, purchaser of uh, ETFs. They're the largest single shareholder. They even eclipse the GPIF, the uh, government pension investment fund. Um, so, But they don't have voting rights. So if your largest shareholder is the Bank of Japan for many Japanese companies um, and they don't have voting rights, um, I think our friend Nick Benish in Tokyo would say that this is a structural issue that um, makes reform and the kind of changes that we've just been talking about in wages, for example, very difficult. Um, what it does is, you know, the, the price making mechanism, which tells people where to allocate their money where to put their money. And when you want to shift it from a country, from a company with less growth prospects to one with better growth prospects, that isn't functioning when the Bank of Japan is basically setting the price of stocks. It's not that they, it's, it, it's you know, they're not using their ownership in a, in a political way in that sense of directly manipulating what companies do. But they're distorting the price mechanism. The same thing, by the way, is happening in the JGB market uh, right. as well. And um, there's one thing I, I think that, that, that John and I would agree on is uh, if you want a market to function, prices have got to both signal people what's the right thing to do and to give them the incentive to do the right thing. And if you don't let the price mechanism operate, whether in the market for goods and services or the market for capital, you're going to have a problem. And if you have a quarter century of near zero interest rates, which means that the, the zombiest company in the world can look like it's solvent, so a third of all Japanese borrowing, the interest rate is less than one quarter of 1%, which means you could be the most moribund company in the world and, and, and yet you look solvent. And the reason for that, in my view, is that Japan relied entirely on monetary policy. If it had a better mix of monetary policy, fiscal policy, and structural reform, then as Abe promised but did not deliver, then I think Japan would have been in much, much better shape. But the thinking of the Abe administration was that monetary policy alone could solve Japan's problems. It didn't produce the 
sustainable inflation that Corona promised he would get in two years. It certainly has not raised growth. Growth is worse. Uh, and it's not improved living standards. It's, it's really been a failure because they thought monetary policy alone could do the job. Doesn't uh, the Bank of Japan also own the majority of JGBs? Aren't they the largest holder? I think it's more than half at this point. And yeah, they, they very they, much stepped up their buying. Absolutely. So. And in fact, and as a result, by the way, what that means, because the, the Bank of Japan owns these JGBs, they are monetizing the, the debt, even though they deny it. Because they are, the amount of JGBs held by private investors has gone way, way, way down. Now, if that's the case, that means when the Mon Ministry of Finance says we can't afford to have a proper fiscal policy, for example, roll back the consumption tax, give people more money to spend and they'll spend it. They say we can't afford to do it because we'll be like Greece, we'll have a crisis. Well, no, they won't because the debt held by private investors is much, much less as a share of GDP and in absolute numbers than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. So that there, there is there is a room to, to do this thing. There's room to have a, a right policy mix of monetary, fiscal, and proper structural reform, growth pro growth policies. And, and that would work. And that's not happening now. now no. um, so John, um, you're an, also an expert in exchange rates and everybody has been watching the intervention of the of uh, the Japanese government in exchange rates. How do you see that and how does that fit into this overall picture of its monetary policy? Well, taken on its own, the intervention is counterproductive to easy money because when the Bank of Japan buys yen in the foreign exchange market on behalf of the Ministry of Finance, it's taking yen out of circulation, which is restricting the amount of yen. So either Kuroda has to turn around and inject more money on the domestic side, you know, or the bank, uh, the money supply will slow down. And that's a major reason uh, why we moved away from fixed exchange rates to avoid that kind of uh, disruption of monetary policy by, by virtue of intervention. But I, I want to go back to what um, Rick was saying, because, I mean, he can't just get away with saying that my numbers are wrong. My numbers come from the Bank of Japan um, and the Japanese government uh, agencies. And the theory is not that there is a direct correlation between money and the CPI. The theory is called the quantity theory of money. And what it says is that if you increase the quantity of money, three things happen. First, there's a change in the amount of money that people hold. Second, there's an impact on real economic activity. And third, there is an impact, there may be an impact on inflation. Now, you said that the money supply since 1997 had gone up by 250%. Well, you're out by 150%. I've just checked the numbers on my screen here. Uh, the M2 went from 660, uh, I think, I'm not sure, the unit to trillion to 1209 1, trillion. So it was just up by just over 100% in that time frame from, from then until the present. If you translate that into rates of change, that's exactly three, almost exactly 3% per annum which is too low. Now that 3% growth in money in Japan first went into increases of money holdings of 2.4% per annum. That's been a very steady relation in Japan since the 1950s. Second, growth, I don't know what you want to average it as I didn't check the numbers, but it's somewhere between half a percent and 1% per annum uh, since 1997. So if we take 2.4% plus 1%, that's 3.4%. Those are two things that money has to finance. That's 3.4%, which is more than the amount of money the Bank of Japan has produced. And as a result, Japan has had deflation. So those are the numbers. And that is why Japan has continued to have subpar inflation. Uh, and until the money growth rates are changed, 
uh, for whatever reason. Um, I think that uh, you know, Japan will continue, as I said in my paper, in this low inflation, low interest rate equilibrium. One other John, point. John, I can I ask question? There's one, there's one other point I want to okay. make, and that is that um, you cannot say that um, imports are the sole cause of inflation. You're confusing relative prices with overall prices. If import prices go up and are sustained at a higher level, you know, other people and people continue to buy the same amount of goods, uh, other prices will go down. But the overall level of prices in, in Japan or in any other country is determined by the amount of money people have. If, if I have to spend more on oil and gas, uh, then I've got less money to spend on other things. And let's say the price of services will go down, the price of those energy items goes up. But if the, if the, if the government, the, the banking system, and the central bank create more money, then overall prices can rise. So you know, it, it's, it's um, misleading to say that the inflation is caused by uh, the imports. They are a, a, way, a stepping stone by which the amount of money in a country translates into the overall level of prices, but they're not the cause of inflation. Okay, I, I was looking up the numbers when John was speaking, so I didn't hear the exact numbers he said, but here's the, here's the data that I have from the Bank of Japan. This is M2 plus certificates of deposits, which is the typical measure of broad money. So in the first quarter of 1997, it was 562 trillion in the most recent quarter for which we have data, which is the third quarter, 2022, it was 1,246 trillion. Yeah, which is, so they, which is oh, John, let me finish. Just the, over 100%. John, it's 2 point, it's, it's the amount, the amount in 2022 was 2.22, not 250%, but 222%, as much as it was in 1997. Okay. In other, words, in other words, the money supply is more than is more than doubled, which is what I said. Now, let me switch to your question about the yen, because we can go back and forth on its money supply, and I think people have, have gotten know where we stand. I, I'm sorry on the on the yen. Uh, if you look at there's there's sort of long term and short term uh, a whole bunch of factors that affect the yen rate, but in the last few years, the best predictor of the value of the yen dollar has been the gap between the 10-year U.S. Treasury note and the 10-year bond rate in Japan. As U.S. has raised interest rates and Japan has not, money is lured from Japan to the U.S. When people take their money out, they convert it from yen to dollars and that lowers the value of the yen. So there's like a, there's a in the last two since July of 2020 there's a 98 percent correlation which is pretty damn good unheard of between the gap between U.S. and Japanese interest rates and as long as Kuroda is insisting that Japanese rates will not rise and I understand why he's not he's afraid it's its impact on the economy he's I've got a, a real dilemma there uh, but. As long as the U.S. rates are rising and Japanese rates are standing still and this gap rises, then the yen will keep on falling. And that is, uh, as I said, over the long term, you can see a whole bunch of factors. But the reason it went from 110 to 150, the main thing is the gap between U.S. and Japanese monetary policy. Okay, so I wanted to step back and ask you both what your individual views on the Japanese economy, how policy works, um, how that um, impacts your vision for the future of Japan. Are you optimistic? Are you not? John, do you think they're not listening to the important data and so that they're likely to just muddle along? Um, or Rick, you've written about innovation in the Japanese economy. Do you think there's a possibility there could, I mean, with all this cheap money, and um, labor that doesn't cost that much, uh, and a weekend, you would think that that would set the stage 
for revitalization, at least on the corporate side. So how does this, uh, John, how do you look at the, the future of the Japanese economy? Well, I agree with uh, Rick on many issues. I think that Japan could do a lot more in the area of reform, deregulation, and so on. Um, and they would benefit, but the political forces lined up against that are very strong. And as, as he's written about eloquently, you know, even a strong prime minister like um, Prime Minister Abe uh, was unable to kind of overcome that um, resistance to fundamental reforms and therefore the amount of um, innovation and restructuring of the economy was a lot less than it might otherwise have been. I don't think that's going to change very drastically. But Japan has kind of achieved a sort of comfortable, uh, rather slow uh, momentum. Um, obviously, it's got an aging problem. Um, but I, I don't think that um, they, they're going to get out of this um, low interest rate, low inflation um, situation that they're in. Um, the economy will continue to grow at a modest rate. I mean, there will be brilliant Japanese innovators in some areas, Japanese scientists, Japanese um, uh, researchers, um, and you know, some, some areas where they com outcompete the world. But I mean, that the economy could be a lot more vibrant um, if some of those reforms were implemented. But that, you know that these are not areas of monetary policy. Uh, the monetary policy really only affects um, ultimately in the long run the price level. Okay, and Rick, what is your view? Well, you know, Japan has had a lot of opportunities to revive, and it's so far not missed any opportunity to miss an opportunity. I think I think Abe actually had the clout where he could have overcome the resistance. But he chose to, to spend his political capital on security issues rather than domestic reform because he thought Bank of Japan magic would all he need to do. He didn't need to step on any toes. But there are some fundamental changes beneath the surface in Japan, which tell me that Japan is the best opportunity in a generation if it will seize that opportunity. And Kishida, with his new capitalism, claims he wants to, and there's a lot of value in what he proclaims, the question is, will he turn his lofty goals into practical measures? And there we have a problem. But he, here's, here's what I find hopeful in Japan. First of all, there's a huge change in generational attitudes. The idea that Japanese are inherently risk averse and non-entrepreneurial, you know, it was an effervescence of entrepreneurship after World War II that produced the Japanese economic miracle. It was earlier that produced the major restoration. Now you have the graduates from the top universities creating companies, founding companies. 20% of Japan's 55 billionaires, which is too small for a country like Japan, uh, created companies in the last, uh, or became billionaires in the last 25 years, not by inheritance, but by creating firms. Uh, I visited a lot of these firms. The, it's a breath of fresh air. You see these young people, dynamic, moving, excited about doing stuff. You see a lot of women in the office. Now, the reason, reason that's interesting, it's very hard for talented, ambitious women to get promoted in traditional Japanese companies. But they can go to these entrepreneurial companies. And so they're a hidden treasure when one of the biggest problems for these companies was finding people to come work for them, take a chance. Well, these women are, and you see them there. But also younger people, people in their 20s and 30s, are much more willing to spend a few years, seven, eight years at a big company, learn how things are run, and then move to a startup where they feel they can do something exciting with their career. So the generational change, the gen gender change. Another issue is technology. We have really moved from the analog era to the digital era. And Japan has not very, done very well on that. It ranks horribly low in a measure called business agility in digital, like 63% out of 65 countries. I don't remember the exact number, but it's something like that. And, these, and they do an index every year. And the problem is that digital, well, the thing about digital technology is two things. One, it's not just a way of cutting costs by doing what you've always done. 
It's a way to re-engineer the company, do new things you never did before, improve products, new products. But the second thing is that technology breaks up political relations and social relations. So the, one of the biggest problems for new companies in Japan was how do they get their products to the public when a distribution system is controlled by the big incumbents? Well, e-commerce does that. It outflanks the traditional distribution system. So Rakuten has got uh, 40, something like 40,000 small and medium companies sold about $40 billion worth of goods on Rakuten alone, not counting Yahoo, uh, Amazon, all kinds of other e-commerce things. And so that the technology not only hurts those big incumbents who can't keep up with the times, but it also creates all kinds of opportunities for new companies. I'm now, the two big I'm obstacles here. to this, one is finance. It's very, very hard for new companies in Japan to get financing. There are proposals of various kinds of things that would help them get financing. The banking system is not where it's going to come from. So finance, it's a huge issue. If you haven't got the money, you can't get off the ground. And the second issue is the politics of protecting incumbents, whether they be big giants or these small and medium you know, zombie companies. So these are both problems. There is a scenario by which even that is changing. So the opportunity is there. It's still an uphill climb, but you know, I cannot help but be a, well, a short-term, I would say realist rather than pessimist, a short-term realist about Japan. Long-term, I'm optimistic. This, this is wonderful. A, it's good to hear that. <laughs> I mean, this is a company that's operating below its punching weight. It's the whole is less than the sum of the parts. Really brilliant people are caught in rigid institutions. And if you have the right institutional change, you can unleash that human capital. Okay. So have the opportunity and let's vote for hope, the triumph of hope over experience. Okay. Well, thank you so much, both both John and Rick. I really appreciate your comments and your forthrightness in, in stating your views. Um, we're going to go to questions now. And uh, Andrew, um, would you like to and identify yourself and ask your question? I've unmuted you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, just before I ans uh, ask the question, I just want to say it's so good to have two rep representatives of two very different schools of thought present their views. I think we're missing one. So in addition to reflationist school, which I think John here represents, and the structuralist school, as I call it, that Rick here represents, I think uh, it would have been also helpful to hear someone from what I call the fiscalist school, sort of the Richard Koo approach to uh, mm -hmm. Japan's problems, which, which is distinct and, and, and quite different, actually. Uh, but in terms of my question, um, I, I wanted to... Um, uh, use the opportunity to to, to draw uh, the attention of both speakers. And I think Rick mentioned that in one of his uh, posts earlier, um, some weeks ago. Um, Japan has fallen behind in terms of uh, its GDP per capita uh, versus both South Korea and, and Taiwan. And from what I've seen, most people of the structuralist persuasion uh, tend to explain that by you know, structural reforms or lack thereof and things surrounding typical structuralist uh, perspectives. But I was wondering, because I haven't looked at this, w if we looked at the broad money supply trends in Japan versus those two countries, um, and I don't know if you've done that, John, but do you think there might be an alternative explanation along your lines when it comes to the national income per capita divergence? Thank you. Um, I don't think that could explain the difference in real uh, per capita income. Uh, real factors in, in the end are not really determined by mon monetary policy at all. Um, it's the institutional structure, the, the technological changes, the, the level of education, uh, the productivity, all of those are real tangible fact or real factors. Um, so I don't, I don't think that that's um, going to explain much of the, the difference um, between Japan and Korea in recent years. Could I add something on that? Um, first of all, Andrew, on the fiscalist, I agree with a lot of Richard, what Richard Koo says. I, I just think it's not the whole story. It's part of the story. But um, 
I generally agree as a general principle with what John just said, but I would add a little wrinkle to it. You know, if an economy is operating is very stable economically, that it has mild business cycles, and most of the time it's operating at its full potential, and what they call potential GDP, then what we find over time is that those economies which have that macroeconomic stability, there will be on average a higher level of investment in both tangible goods and intangible skills. Uh, the skill, people don't lose their skills because they're out of work for five years, which makes it harder to come back to jobs. So among the what I would regard as the real fundamentals to which John refers, one of them is macroeconomic stability, part of which is the proper monetary and fiscal policy. So in that way, while you can't magically create 10% growth by putting out, you know, tons and tons of money, the extent that monetary policy contributes to keeping the economy having mild business cycles and able to recover from shocks, then uh, your overall average trend rate of growth is, is going to be better. And I think that, along with R&D and all sorts of other things, is, is among the factors uh, which, which really help Korea, Korea not fall into the middle income trap, keep on growing, despite having many flaws similar to Japan. It's okay. a very interesting case. Thank you. So we're going to our next question from Chris Rigg. Uh, well, first of all, I'd just like to uh, thank Richard and John for their presentations, and nice to see you, John, again. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, John a question, and Richard might have a view on it, but if uh, we get a pickup in wage growth in Japan. Uh, the labor market's uh, very tight there and might tighten further uh, because of demographics. If we do get a pickup in wage growth, could that cause an acceleration in deposit growth in, in the non-bank sector and therefore lead to stronger nominal GDP growth and price growth in Japan, John? I think it's very unlikely. Um, in, in general, that's the wrong way around. Um, and I know that in in Britain, for example, uh, with incomes policies, they tried to sort of dictate wages in the 70s and the Bank of England accommodated that. But nowadays we have independent central banks for a reason. They're trying to control inflation. So we're much more likely to see changes in money money growth um, impacting the overall growth of wages in nominal terms, not in real terms, uh, but in uh, nominal terms. Uh, the real part will be determined by product, productivity and so on. So I, I, I don't think that um, legislating higher wages or you know, persuading the companies to pay higher wages is really going to change the trajectory of the economy significantly. Okay, thank you. Next question, we're going to go to... Uh, I, oh, do you want to say something? Sure, yeah, I think because I think the labor issue is, is one of the key things uh, that Japan has uh, in Japan. Uh, a rigid labor market is one of the uh, heart of a lot of their rigidities uh, elsewhere. Listen, Japan, the, the, the question about wages, it's not an income as policy, but you know, throughout the advanced sector, a big change has occurred in the last few decades, but worst of all in Japan, which is that wages per hour or co total compensation per hour should grow at more or less the same rate as output per hour for a market economy to be stable. And that's historically the reason. In the last few decades, uh, throughout the rich countries, productivity has, wages have not kept up with productivity growth. And this has to do with weaker bargaining power of labor, technology, and any number of, of, of issues that can be discussed. But it's worth the gap between productivity and wages is worst in Japan, in part because the labor is so weak. Now, there are laws on the books that would make a big difference. For example, you know, Japan, everybody used to have a so-called lifetime, well, not everybody, they used to have more or less regular jobs. Aside from about 15% of the labor force, these are people who had 
you know, but I'm not getting the details, regular jobs. Now it's about 40%. Those people are part-timers or temporary workers who get paid an hourly wage as much as third or 50% less than the regular workers, even though that's against the law. The law is very, quite clear. You cannot discriminate on wages or based upon regular versus non-regular status or because male versus female. But these laws are not enforced. There is no agency of the Japanese government which is in charge with actually finding out violations and correcting them. So simply by enforcing their laws, they could do a great deal to increase wages. The minimum wage in Japan is actually quite low by international standards. They are beginning to raise it. And this is something that Abe did that was good, increase the rate, but it's still low. And when you increase the minimum wage, not only do you increase the wage of people below it, but people whose wages are 15 or 20 percent. In the case of Japan, we're talking about maybe 10, 15 million people whose income would rise. Now, if people had more income to spend, instead of having all this fallow cash lying in the hands of corporations, it would go, be tra instead of transferring wealth from households to companies who do nothing with it in the last couple of decades, you'd be re reversing that, going back to the way it used to be, then the households would spend that money on goods and services. And then companies would have a reason to expand capacity. So I think the, having coupling wage growth with labor flexibility would do a lot to improve Japan's both potential growth rate and its macroeconomic stability. Okay. Well, next we're going to go to... <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Rick. We're going to... Uh, David Bowling has a uh, question about the yen. Uh, thank you both. So, of course, all of this is occurring in a political context, and I would be interested to hear your thoughts, if you have any, about how this weighs on Kishida's prospects. Obviously, his poll numbers have nosedived over the past three months, in part because of events related to Abe's death. But over the last few weeks, the yen's depreciation, the intervention by the Ministry of Finance, it's getting a lot more press. I mean, this is something that a reasonably well-informed Japanese citizen certainly knows about, and it's not really positive news. How do you see this playing out for Kishida? Um, not, not well. Um, you know, first of all, the ordinary consumer is paying much higher prices for food and for energy, which is about 36% of their budget. They're doing that, and it's what they see, just like here, right? Gasoline prices are a very good predictor of voting patterns here and in Japan. Um, <clears throat> and so people are very, very discontented, <clears throat> and they see that every day. That is her, certainly hurting uh, uh, Kishida. If you look at companies, the, the, BO, the Bank of Japan argument is that a weak yen is good for Japan because it stimulates exports. And yet... The majority even of big companies, the top 100 companies, say that at this weak level, this weakest level, the weakest level in real terms since 1972 or something like that, that the harm caused by higher import prices is hurting them more than any benefits they might get from exports. So he's lost part of that constituency. The ones who really benefit are the very, very large multinational firms but who cannot count on a weak yen staying, so they're still moving offshore. So yeah, Kishida is in trouble for all kinds of reasons. Uh, it seems to have been triggered by this scandal with the, with the Unification Church, but I think underneath it, it does lie deeper, and there's always a gap between what's the catalyst and what's the underlying roots. Uh, people may be more upset about the Unification Church because the people on whom they rely to take care of them are engaged in those kind of shenanigans rather than paying attention to the welfare of, of the population. So that's how those two issues are, are linked. Okay, we'll go next to Anthony. Anthony, what time is it where you are right now? Two, two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> thank you for being with us. I really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, thank you for staying. Okay. So do so I have a question? Have a question. 
Yes, yeah, you do, I, sir. I do. Yes, okay. please go ahead. Well, um, okay, my question is specifically about the yen uh, exchange rate. Obviously, I'm aware of the, the, the factors uh, of um, differential um, interest rates and so on. But um, is the yen really weak or is it, in fact, moving back towards some kind of pre-Plaza Accord equilibrium? Uh, and, you know, given that the Amer America and the U.S. now doesn't jump on Japan and accused of um, uh, undervaluing the yen. So is the yen, as I said, moving back, in in fact, to a kind of uh, equilibrium, which is more in keeping with its uh, competitiveness and economic fundamentals? John, you want to go first and I'll go? Or? Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure that you know, these um, equilibria hold over sort of very long periods of time because the, the compositions of the price indices change. And so you know, calculating purchasing power parities is, is tricky at the best of times. And you can normally only get you know, the roughest of relationships. Um, I think that um, you know, we, we're currently seeing you know, interest rate differentials dominate uh, because the marginal investor perceives that the Fed is tightening more rapidly than other central banks, and uh, Kuroda san is determined to remain with rates as they are, as, as Rick said. So. Um, that, that's currently driving things. But I, I do think that at some point in the not too distant future, when people start to perceive that either the Fed has stopped raising rates or even starts to lower them because of the depth of the US recession, then I think we could see a very abrupt reversal in not only the yen, but also uh, the euro and the pound and, and other currencies. So. Um, I think that uh, that that I would expect possibly to happen sometime next year, and that would look like the Plaza Accord, uh, the, sorry, the Plaza Agreement of September 1985, when the yen had been very very strong, and then subsequently it plummeted. Sorry, the dollar had been very very strong, and then it plummeted very sharply subsequently. Yeah. Um uh, Anthony, I think it's gone beyond returning to that equilibrium. It's it's very low in real terms. The Bank of Japan puts out a series on this, which is the the real value of the real purchasing power of the yen against all of Japan's trading partners, going back to 1970. And uh, you know, it had long before the Plaza Accord, uh, the yen had risen. The real value had risen. If we take the overall average as an index of 100, it was 60 back in 1970. By the late 70s, early 80s, it was fluctuating between 80 and 100. Now it's back down to, then it went way up to 160. It had overshot uh, by the mid 90s. And so it had to come back down, but it's back down now back down to the low 60s. So I think it's way overshot. The immediate trigger for that is, as John and I both agree, is the is the differential in monetary policy between the Fed and and, and Japan. But uh, I think part of that decline does reflect a decline in Japan's overall competitiveness, which is seen in two ways. One has to do with productivity growth, but the second, the extent to which some of Japan's most competitive firms are increasingly producing offshore, say, for example, uh, the auto companies. Electronics companies, which had been run trade surpluses for years in Japan, now run chronic trade deficits. The Japan's electronic companies have lost their competitiveness. So that means their, their trade balance is affected by this. So I think it partly reflects the monetary difference, but overall, but, uh, longer terms, it does reflect the loss of competitiveness but I think it's overshot even that. 
Okay. Well, we're going to head back to Chicago for a couple of questions. Uh, we're trying to fit in everything before 12.15. And Kareem Pakravan, one of our EconView commentators, um, uh, would like to, to ask a question. Hi. Uh, very interesting discussion. Um, I used to go to Japan very often in the 1990s, uh, where the, the banking system was in deep trouble and uh, was trying to recover from their massive bad loans and so on and so forth. But uh, since then, basically, the Japanese banking sector has been AWOL. I mean, uh, they don't play a role internationally anymore, and they don't seem to be playing a big um, role domestically. They're in macro and sort of the macro sort of environment. So, uh, how you how you see their role in? Uh, Japanese macroeconomics right now? Um, I think, well, first of all, I, I agree with what you said. I, I would add a couple things. One is that, you know, what used to be a banking crisis has now been transferred into a low growth crisis by simply, if you bring the interest rates to zero, then the banks seem to be doing fine but the companies, you're, you're, you're really having life support system for a lot of companies which should die or, or downsize and give room to newer companies to, to go to get ahead. But this, certain, this glut of poorly performing companies depress prices and make it harder for the, for the better companies. So that policy actually makes things worse. And there's lots of data showing that the companies exiting the market actually in many cases have higher productivity than, than some of the ones remaining. So the superior companies survive, the awful companies survive, and that middle ground of good companies that could get even better are having trouble. Secondly, you know, the, the Japanese banks do, do a good job of banking. They, they lend based upon collateral, huge amounts of government credit guarantees, the highest except for Korea and the world, gigantic as opposed to having people really, really trained in credit evaluation and in, in saying, what's the cash flow projections for this firm? They're not trained in that. They, they don't do good banking because they're just, they're, they're, in fact, the government said, you don't need to go, do good banking. You tell a firm to, to buy a credit guarantee. So if, if it goes bankrupt, you know, we'll, we'll come up with the 80% of the cash. So you don't have to think about is this a good company or a bad company. Also, if steak and filet, if chuck and filet mignon cost the same price, well, guess what? The store shelves of filet mignon are gonna be empty and chuck you know, is gonna be a glut. And so that's what's happened with Japanese companies. You've made filet mignon companies pay the same price for interest as, as uh, ground chuck. Well, I'm going to now go to Katie for the last question, if I may. Katie, are you unmuted? Hold on. Yes, you're you on. Now? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. All right, terrific. Well, thank you for the great presentation. I really enjoyed this. Um, one question relates to Japan being the largest foreign holder of public U.S. debt. So I think it's around 1.3 trillion. And I'm, I'm wondering what impact could result if Japan begins selling some of that U.S. debt, clearly looking at this through the vantage point of the, the U.S. Do you see any reason why they, they might, might wish to sell and, and, and thus, um, you know, you know could, it could result in the further tightening of our, our, U.S., our U.S. bond market? Kind of a broad question, but I'd be interested in your view. The Treasury Department has studied this a million times because at various points, people said, oh, Japan is going to use its bonds as a weapon. They'll, with they'll withdraw the bonds or crash our bond market unless we you know, yield to them on this or that trade issue. And then the same thing was said about China. You know, China's going to crash our bond market. Now, besides, they would be shooting themselves in the foot and are not likely to do it. The fact is when you add up all of the foreign holdings of, of uh, 
U.S. Treasury bonds, the Japanese share, the Chinese share, the domestic stuff. Um, it's simply not big enough to cause a problem that the Federal Reserve could not deal with versus various sorts of, of monetary policy. One of the things that I think the Fed did extremely well, uh, Bernanke was part of the creation of the problem in the 2000s along with Greenspan, uh, with the, this derivatives and all this stuff. But when the crisis happened, Bernanke did exactly the same right thing. He should, they should build a statue to the guy. By the way, there were predictions at the time that he expanded the money supply so much you were bound to have hyperinflation. Never happened. No apology from those who forecast it. So I think it's, it's, it's not that it will have negligible impact. It will have an impact, but it's nothing that the Fed could not handle um, if need be because their ratio to the overall overhang of treasury bonds is just too small, and it would hurt them if they did okay. it beyond a certain amount. I, I so, don't John, do you have a, a, a something to add? I'm going to give you the last word here. Um, no, I was going to make basically the same points. The, the Japanese would be the first people to be hurt. There was a very good interview about 10 years ago with the manager of the Japanese um, foreign exchange reserves. And he said, you know, the problem is immediately we start to sell our current uh, holdings and de depreciate in value, number one. Number two, yeah, U U.S. government debt outstanding is something of the order of, is it $23 trillion? So we're talking about, you know, 5%. And given the re restraints on selling, um, I don't think it's going to be too much concern. The, the dominant driver of uh, returns on U.S. bonds is what happens in the United States and expectations about what's going to happen in the United States not who happens to own the bonds and whether they're buying or selling. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. Um, and we'll be posting this in a couple of days, and we will add papers by both John Writing and Rick so that you can look at their individual arguments in more in more detail. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone, if you aren't already subscribed to EconView, that you do come to our website. And we would again like to thank our sponsor, the Dylan Scheider Group in New York, Miami, and Chicago. And uh, the people also thank the people behind the scenes that are making this work. Um, Sam Fu, our producer, and Ying Zan, our uh, editor. Uh, we really appreciate their efforts that made this our first live, um, our first live panel go pretty much without a hitch. So thank you for all of your patience and participation. And we look forward to the next one. We'll do one probably in November and December, a forecasting panel for 2023. So we hope you'll join us then. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.